no slide? You yes. Yeah, we okay, can see it. it. Yes. Okay. So for those of you who came in late, this is a picture of um, a dike, as the Dutch called them. And it, it holds back the ocean, which is above the land here. And obviously, if there's water that goes over the dike, it's a problem. But if the dike breaks, we call them levees, we call them dikes, we call them dams. Uh, I was saying that Dr. Duran had a discussion called Life Behind the Quality Dikes. And uh, I, I had a pretty good... Um, Last year, we talked about how technology is removing jobs from the quality function and other functions. This is more on the upbeat side about how maybe we can sell ourselves a little bit better. Um, just to, I'm just gonna move some of these things away here. How do I get rid of that? Okay, there we go. All right. So um, those of you who don't know Dr. Duran, he was the founder of our company and uh, he and our past uh, Chairman Bland Godfrey, uh, both, and I'm trying to continue that legacy, but uh, both talk about life behind the quality dikes. And uh, Dr. Duran started it. And it's really about how we prevent catastrophic failure, catastrophic uh, events from causing real damage to society. Uh, we've seen some of them and I'm sure you've had some of them in your own organizations. Uh, I just will begin my 33rd year at uh, Duran. I'm uh, more in an executive advisor role than I am at running the company. Uh, but we've been focused on the future of quality these last few years, uh, and not just in the sense of the future of the uh, quality, quality function, but also future of quality methods and what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, educating and training and certifying in that. Uh, and uh, and that's what we do. Uh, matter of fact, you know, uh, Cynthia, we had to work with a very large healthcare company in Little Rock, Arkansas, Baptist Health. So we, we get around. So to begin, uh, here's a woman uh, balancing on this, uh, this dike and um, and it's a good picture because we balance between the technologies that help and make us better, cheaper, faster with the worry that that technology may also fail. And so this picture kind of shows how she's balancing herself. And that's kind of what we do uh, with business. We balance the cost of quality with the profit of the company. We balance the cost of designing product features into our products with the cost and what the customer is willing to pay. And here we're talking about balancing between doing enough to prevent failure from the same technology that um, we think is going to benefit us. And the Dutch, who are great experts at building dams, matter of fact, this is a more of a permanent dam but they actually built a movable dam uh, towards the mouth of the North Sea. And it's one of the greatest feats of, of water construction ever done. It's a massive, massive um, uh, device. I've, I've been to it a number of times and literally it moves up and down with the tide. So they can move it. If there's a storm coming in, they can raise it and lower it. But by the time they finished that in the 1990 or so, the water levels were already rising, and they said that it probably will only will be able to keep the water back till about 2050. Uh, and by then, the water levels will have risen again where they have to do something else. So they're constantly holding back the water. But what happens when the water breaks? And some of you may not know this, but um, World War II, one of the big wins that the Allied forces had was to blow up the dead flood some lower portion of the Netherlands to get the Germans out. So there's some benefit to blowing up a dam, but uh, not much. Now, where does the story come from? Well, Harlem is a city outside of Amsterdam, and it was a popular story about the little Dutch boy. And there are various, you know, replays of this story, uh, but it was written by actually an American. Uh, and if you remember Hans Brinker, uh, the story was based on this Dutch boy. 
and the boy noticed a hole in the dam. And so he went and put his finger in it until enough help came along. Uh, and he stayed the entire night until help came along and he saved the town. And so I want you to think of your job as the little boy. And every time you come up with a new product, a new service, a new process change, a new supplier in the supply chain, you're the one that's preventing that leak. You're, 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 you're preventing a leak from growing into a catastrophic problem with your methods, your tools, and your knowledge. If that little boy wasn't there, you could kind of see what's going to happen. Uh, I'm working with the um, largest lithium ion battery manufacturer in the world in China. They have 60% market share. And I've interviewed the senior leaders over the last few months, and I asked them a question. What would happen if all your quality personnel decided to leave the company tomorrow? What would happen? About 50% of them said nothing will happen, and the other 50% said we'll probably have major catastrophic failure. Now, for the 50% who basically, it's like out of 50 people or so, that said nothing would happen, they actually put a caveat. They said nothing will happen in the short term, but in the long term, where nobody's reviewing or auditing our, our methods, we're going to fall down. And, in, and the ones who said it'll fall apart tomorrow were very worried because there's technology that they're, everybody's got their finger in the dam. So think of yourself as that little Dutch boy. Now, why does this happen? And what does it have to do with quality? Well, um, since I gave this presentation in, um, in England, um, here's an example. This was an example a couple of years ago uh, of a very sad, disastrous fire. And you can see by the timeline there, uh, it was a very large apartment building that just went up in smoke and, and I think 200 people perished, if I recall. And the, the initial manufacturer said, it was, you know, we, it was nothing wrong, there was nothing wrong. But in fact, the insulation in it uh, was not fireproofed as it was supposed to be. And so they had this new foam technology. It went into the buildings, the inspectors inspected it, they passed it. And when it caught fire, the whole building went up in flames. So once again, a technology cat catastrophe. Um, some that you might be more familiar with here, oh, here in America, let's see what happened there, um, are some of the most notorious defective products in recent history. Uh, you're all familiar with the, uh, the Samsung Galaxy, not from the manufacturer that I was talking to you about, uh, but the overheating of the Galaxy. And, and what's important here is regardless of the cause, we rely on technology to provide us long lasting batteries so we can use our devices. And that failure cost Samsung in the cost itself, $10 billion. Uh, and a supplier of the battery reputation. A few more that you're familiar with, uh, the Firestone tire defect of number of years ago, Volkswagen's emission scandal. And just look at the, the, the staggering cost, 15 billion. Um, the Vioxx cardiac events from Merck in 2004. Uh, Mattel toys with toxic paint. Each of these are from notoriously well-known companies with major catastrophic failure. Why does it happen? Now, you know, Volkswagen's a very reputable company. Uh, Takata was a very reputable company. General Motors. How does good things happen, uh, bad things happen in good companies? Anybody want to chime in? Why do bad things happen to your companies? Complacency. Compliance. Com lack of compliance, maybe, right? Oh, what else? Watching what's supposed to be watched and not doing the appropriate amount of inspections and auditing and uh, allowing a, some supplier to produce stuff just to get a cheap price and then thinking it'll be okay and then finding out it later it isn't. And, you know, I didn't throw Boeing in there purposely, but Boeing would have been an easy one to throw in there. Profits. And yeah, you know, what's that? Profits. Maybe. But they're all, you know, but you have to also know these are companies that have good quality systems. But the point here is that 
all of them are dealing with advanced technologies and those advanced technologies in small samples work fine. Large samples, they work fine, but really large samples over time, things start to break down. And, and the question might be, why? Well, maybe that there was something flaw, flawed in the design, but we can keep our finger in the dike long enough, nothing will happen. My example is a slot machine. You know, slot machines have to pay out a certain percentage of the money. Now, if you stood at a slot machine and you could outlast the, the uh, casino, you'd win. But the reality is very few people are going to win big the big time. But it's going to happen. Somebody's going to win. And in this case, it's a bad slot machine. Uh, we, we, we stretch our belief on how safe our products are going to be and how good our products are going to be. As long as we have enough system in place to avoid failure for a while, we'll be okay. Unfortunately, some of those other things do take over, like complacency, like cost reduction. Um, but even the best companies still have problems. And, and sure, it all comes down to someone, you know, making the wrong decision about something. But the reality is another way to look at it is maybe it's just we're living in a technological world. And as a result, this is just the consequence uh, of that world. Uh, and so... Here's another little, oh, boop, 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 go back. Come on, go back, there we go. Look at this stat here. Um, consumer product inju uh, injuries, 13 and a half million, 2017. FDA recalled almost 10,000 products and sent out 15,000 warning letters. These are to organizations that make drugs, medicines, medical devices, that keep us healthy, alive, and well, and toys that make our kids happy and avoid hurting them. Um, but they're huge. And why? Quality methods, quality systems. Well, it's gotta be something more than just not enough quality people. And it's way to think about that, that we've got our finger in that dike. And Dr. Duran uh, would tell people that we've made we become very dependent. Now think about the quality of when he's making these statements in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You know, we're dependent on the quality of our technology as part of our daily life. And historically, when technology failed, it didn't have that big of an impact. Let's think about this. Pre-computers, a uh, pre-internet. Uh, we had mainframe computers sitting in a room or a basement or another building on the factory property. And when that thing went, something failed, that facility failed. Not so catastrophic, it shut down till we fix it. Advance 20 to 30 years and take that mainframe, spread it all across the universe putting it into warehouses, which we call the cloud. Now, when that fails, what happens? The entire universe gets impacted. So the technology that we like, in other words, get rid of the mainframes in here, let mainframe manufacturers manage them well, and we use their services until it fails. And so the more technology we have, the more dependent that we become on it. Uh, the more important we have to have systems that prevent that leak in the dike. Are any of you right now, this, this past year is a very odd year, but are any of you experiencing any kind of technological failure where the quality of your technology has caused pain for your company, for your customers or society? I can, of course, I can. you get a... I can talk about my, my company is having trouble because we'd like to get technology repaired and our uh, supplier is overseas. So we're hobbling. And why are you overseas? Because no, our, uh, technology this, our, enabled you to get there. Yeah. No, because technology That's enabled right. you to get there, right? Yeah. It used so. to be we'd have to make things here, but we can fly parts around the world pretty quick. 
So we have to increase our uh, quality checks because the uh, machines are not working as smoothly as, as uh, normal. And it causes a lot more pain than it did historically. So think yeah. about your home. Um, I mean, how many of you lose one of your cell phone cords at least five to 600 times a year? Or your battery goes dead just when you need it and you're on a Zoom? All the technology in your house. Matter of fact, one way to find out my technology you have, shut all your lights off and count the LEDs. We've got a lot of technology. And when they fail, it's like done. Um, you know, one of these great ideas is I have gas stove. Don't have to worry about an electrical outlet, uh, electrical outage, right? But what's on the gas stove today that prevents me from using it? when we lose electricity. Safety valves that shut off the gas to prevent a failure. So technology, once again, we have to live with it. So we have become something that resembles what the Dutch have been talking about with the little Dutch boy. Uh, we've gained a lot by pushing back the sea with these enormous walls. And so technology being the wall, we have to be very careful that the wall doesn't break. Bob Dylan actually wrote a song called The Levee It's Gonna Break. And we saw what happened down there. So what you have to do is you have to maintain those dikes forever. Nuclear power, one of the greatest technologies that probably came along when it did, not from the sake of bombing, but for the sake of power, any of you ever work in the nuclear power industry? So do you know how long a country has to maintain a nuclear power plant that has been shut down due to the fact that it's a hazard from the time they shut it down to this period of time? 40 years, right? 40? Try again. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, more than that? Try again. <laughs> 10, Two, 250 years. So we're paying to maintain the safety of that for 250 years. So think about that. And there's hundreds of these around the world, right? As long as they're running, they're cheap. But when they stop, we got to maintain it until something comes along that allows us to clean that up sooner. I was working with the uh, energy organization in Canada and they uh they they were the place where actually the atom bomb was the scientists were moved to to be safer uh during World War II the beginning of it and they ended up the Manhattan Project moved out there but, but I was listening to a presentation and like yeah 250 years we have to maintain these forever now this dependence is just become part of our life and we accept it. How many of you have, uh, you know, mobile devices that are more than just a phone that rings? Most of you, right? Would you feel comfortable knowing that maybe Apple has a 20% defect rate on the phones that you have or Samsung has a 22% rate? Oh, I would not be happy. <laughs> they do. But can you imagine if you had a 20% defect rate on a Sikorsky helicopter or some of the technology you sell, where would you be? Bankrupt. However, however, it is a fact that the volumes that they have and the failures they have are a lot worse than anybody would ever think of. However, we still accept these as great products because they do things that we've never seen done before. Uh, and yet, they fail a lot. Life behind the quality dike. So someone uh, sent me a chat there, said economic pressure. Yeah, we're, that woman who was balancing on top of the, uh, the dike, the balance between cost and quality, speed and quality, uh, the balance between methods and results. So, you know, there's, we're, we're always trading off even in design, you're trading off the cost of producing something, the cost of design and production versus the benefit you get and what the customer is willing to accept. 
and also what technology limits there are. And you Apex guys know very well about speed, you know, getting product into the supply chain as quickly as possible so we can make it as quickly as possible and pass it out. Uh, you don't want to do supplier checks too much because it slows you down. But then we have to do final test and fail there. But balance between speed and quality. And then the balance between method and results says, hey, I got a defect. I'm going to use really good, tough root cause analysis and get great results. But it takes time to do that. Mm. Some genius comes along and said, well, we can just skip the analysis piece. I think it's this. And let's just put that Band-Aid in place. Balance between method and result. So we're, we're always trying to do that. Now, I'll just speak on the quality side for a moment. If you've been in a quality function, and I know because I've talked to a bunch of you guys, the frustration you have when we're at an imbalance, because the imbalance until a crisis hits always goes into whose favor? Let's give you a hint. The business. Yes, it always goes to the cost, the speed, yep. or skip the method. Until when? Until the result is like a like a bomb going off and the costs are just rolling in. And they say, How until did that happen? The night, <laughs> until the levy breaks. Yep. Right. And then all of a sudden, we have to go back to where we were before. Now, some great companies will go to extremes. The whole Boeing, I, I knew the VP, if you're in ASQ, you probably heard the, the VP speak many times of quality. Um, you know, Boeing basically did not balance any more cost and quality, speed and quality, and the methods they had were in non-compliance. They were literally failing to tell leadership when there were failures that could cost people's lives. Um, and uh, that's why you lose your job. So here's the real neat thing. What is our answer to failures of technology? More technology. Matter of fact, in our space, and this is, we talked about this if you were here last time, um, we're using much more technological tools, not necessarily to eliminate people. It just happens to do that because they're, they do. But these technologies give us better information faster, uh, even in the forms of how we communicate, how we analyze, how we audit. Um, we're, we're working with a out of Hong Kong that I, I, it's, a, um, it's an AI artificial intelligence product which basically collects information from the supply chain and can pinpoint the cause of your failures in the product based on the intelligence of the computer being able to see many, many variables at the same time where the human can't. And so root cause analysis through AI is getting much more effective. Now, here's what will happen. We're going to rely on that until something breaks, like someone hacks into that system and then causes our nuclear grid to go down or our power grids to go down. So we keep throwing technology at it because the new technology will help us prevent that dike from breaking for a little longer period of time, but then we have to worry about that breaking. And we could see it happening now. There's a lot more electronic uh, digital machine monitoring job tracking, visibility. How many of you guys are, you know, you live by your ERP system, job tracking and visibility of supply chain, uh, down to the shop floor where work instructions are automated so people don't mess up. So the one key area that quality will survive in, anybody want to care to, pick the one area of quality that will survive when some of the other ones won't. It's on one of these six slides, uh, six buckets. Don't be shy. Monitoring. 
What's that? I just didn't hear you. Oh, is it uh, mo monitoring? Is, monitoring. Is, no, is that training? Actually, you're right in the money. Training? Monitoring and maintenance. Yeah, the, well, monitoring in the sense of audit and monitoring the systems that are monitoring our machines and our people and our process. Because there's, so if we think about, I make a part and I inspect it. I inspect 100%. I get confidence that I'm only going to have 10 out of 100. So I start to sample and I'm willing to risk that. So my inspection is reduced by the sample size. So from 100% to 50%, to 20%, to 1%, right? And then because that's good, we go from 100% audit to 50% audit to so audit every week to every month, every six months, every year. So we get better. We can reduce the length of time, but we still have to do it. If someone's not auditing, even machines will break down. So the audit function is going to be around, but it's going to be different than it was in the past. We're going to be auditing technology. Uh, you know, you Apex folks, when you um, when you want information, don't you first go to your computer screen before you go talk to someone when you're looking in your supply chain? Absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because the answers are in there. But so so but you trust the answers are there. You trust the information. Yet we know it can't be very trustworthy. Yeah, trust but verify. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's still going to be verification. And so what I want you to think about is the technology that's replacing our jobs is creating better jobs and better future jobs if we're willing to go along with it. If you want to still be a you know quality tracker of parts that are broken, uh, so many people you know make make their living off of tracking dead broken parts uh, and tracking non-conforming material. But if the material is not non-conforming, what are you going to do? Well, you better learn how to track non-conforming technology because that's going to replace you, but you can it, still keep an eye on that. And if we think about, of course, every presentation I have to talk about, the trilogy, if we think about quality management across the enterprise and we think about methods in design quality, which our whole goal here is to try to design things better from the start. Um, and then we begin to operate and, and what we design better isn't exactly always better. So we do quality control, quality assurance, and we have some level of cost of poor quality. And then we have improvement of quality. We get tired of that cost of poor quality and we get some breakthroughs. And, you know, the whole cycle repeats itself. This is what quality management's about. And so as technology moves into quality of control, uh, we still need to do quality of improvement. But I just said that there's new querying tools out there that actually dig in and find root causes and therefore reduces our dependency on people for improvement. And then it's going to move into design. What, what do you think the technology of monitoring consumer behavior customer behavior, customer purchases, that information gathered to help us design better uh, or uh, tools that self-diagnose the existing equipment and give you information on how to design the next one better. Uh, that leadership program I was talking about this morning, uh, there, there's organizations that are using AI to promote leaders based on the querying of the people in their organization based on the interaction they have with their email accounts internally, the words they use on those emails, their social media accounts, and they can predict which employees are going to leave the company when and which employees are more promotable, all without a human touch. Think about that. Somebody is using the collection of all that data in an algorithm that is spitting out fire Joe because he's spending way too time on social media and we compared it to the emails that he's writing and he's not into work anymore. So don't promote Joe. 
<clears throat> big brother got bigger. And there's a big sister now, too. You got to be careful. Of. So as technology replaces one piece, we evolve to look at other pieces. So we mentioned, you know, digital quality is here now. And basically, because we can't afford bodies everywhere, I think I used this example. When Dr. Duran was at the Hawthorne Works plant in Chicago, Western Electric plant in 1920s, 40,000 employees, 15,000 inspectors. Cost effective, no. Necessary, yes, because that was the level of capability we had. But this pressure to reduce cost is pushing pressure on using technology, which is more of a one-time cost. And we're willing to reduce our defect today in light of the slot machine paying off later. And so we're seeing quality control, root cause analysis being done uh, closer to the operation instead of taking weeks. Quality assurance done by monitoring the software you have. Uh, work instructions being done electronically. Uh, and think about document control. This is, you know, huge. Imagine when a, we change a piece of equipment and we have to rewrite the job description, the work instruction, the ISO manual. Now that's all fluid. You know, you change one thing and it clears itself up to the others. Um, improvement will still be there, but probably fewer people do it. And then quality planning, um, you know, this, this understanding consumer needs. Technologically, we're really good at designing stuff, but we never always match our technology necessarily to the need of the customer. Why? Because we're not really good at understanding customer needs and behaviors. Well, now there's more and more science out there that do that. Um, so it's kind of like the way I look at AI today, it's like bookies. <laughs> Ever play the sports and bet on sports? How is it that bookies know exactly what the total score is gonna be of every game of every sport? because they look at the numbers a lot better than we do. And they have more numbers to look at. So they have more, they're the house. They, they have more money to lose. So what can you do to protect yourselves, to protect whether it be your job or your company from technological failure? See the failure here? I've got a computer, a screen, a mouse, uh, and I still can't figure out which one to push to make the slide go forward. There we go. So, so this is the hope for the quality function. And I use the word function because the, one of the other reasons why there are less quality staff is because some of our tasks are being done by other people, other departments. The quality functions carried out by other folks. And then there is the quality office. Uh, those who are in ASQ are probably part of that. It's us, you, me, the inspectors, the QC, the QA staff, the reliability people. Um, we are the ones that are going to survive with less of us, but we're gonna become a lot more important. Why? Because the, the rate of failure is happening faster and faster to some of our technology. And the uh, size of our production in some of these large companies is so huge. You know how big Amazon is now? You know, they're what, they're worth like a trillion dollars. Um, but think about the, think about what could hurt <coughs> Amazon? What could really hurt Amazon? What, you know, what do they live by? the whole concept of Amazon. Speed. Speed of what? Uh, information. In, in, information. Speed of delivery to the consumer. Yeah, delivery, right? yes. Mm -hmm. I got it, I can get it to you. Well, what happened this Christmas and what's happened during COVID? I don't know what your street looks like, but I can tell you my little neighborhood, I will bet you there's an Amazon vehicle 100 times a day. Drive it up yeah. and down my street. Yeah. I'm not on a main road. Yep. Why? Because they're not coordinating. Comes. They're not coordinating the orders in such a way that they can make one pass, and 
and hit all the houses in that neighborhood. I, I, I see, I see um, several times a day, you know, different Amazon trucks from different areas and because they've now set up depots in the larger cities here in Connecticut. Even the small ones, the old Pratt Whitney aircraft here is a, is an Amazon depot now. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So the technology that gives consumers the ability to buy goods shipped directly to your home, sometimes within hours, is yep. got to be wreaking havoc on the supply chain people at Amazon because they still want that. that that's what makes them different. Mm. You know, if I can, if, if it happens that I can go to Walmart or Target and get what I need faster, they're in trouble. Right. Right. <clears throat> and so that technology is leading to failures. The, U, the United States Postal Service eliminated all the political garbage. The Postal Service, because everybody's home. Uh, the cable companies in this last year, everybody's being put to tests mm -hmm. through this pandemic <clears throat> that they never had to deal with before. And they're finding the technology is not holding up. I learned a lot about Cox cable systems here because <laughs> our, our neighborhood's a pretty new neighborhood. And I finally got someone at Cox to tell me the truth. And basically, there weren't enough servers serving this neighborhood. And so we were all fighting for speed and, and bandwidth. They had to invest money to fix it. Now, the only thing that's keeping Fox from driving price up is that we get independent contributors here. So I know Amazon's not us, but the use of technology is going to create havoc in other places. The other thing I worry about is when, when products are shipped to a supermarket, they're shipped in bulk on a pallet. When they're shipped to our house, they're shipped in three different cardboard boxes. I know well, the about ship, you. Shipping can, the shipping requirements have to be oh, my Lord. Bet differently. <clears throat> you yep. know, sometimes it's like when you ever give a kid a gift for Christmas and you put a box inside of a box inside of a box. <laughs> and I open this big box to get another box and I find this little bag of toothpaste in there. It's like, give me a break. Okay. Um, so here's he, so the I know I know people have been and I, and I talk about quality but I think all supply chain people are in the same bucket here um, we need to be seen not as the gloom and doom cost of poor quality people but the preventers of disaster um, think about the safety function in a company the safety function is there to prevent people from getting hurt and your customer from getting hurt and anyone in between. That's their job. They're preventers of hurt. Um, a hospital has one model. We do no harm. We're not supposed to make you worse when you leave the hospital than when you came in. But yet the quality folks, if you ask any manufacturing person, what's quality responsibility? Manage defects and prevent defects. But how much time do you actually spend on preventing defects versus managing defects? We spend 80% of our time on quality control of defects and only 20% of our time between design and improvement. We need to flip that around. Otherwise, we're never going to be seen this way. So my challenge, and, and here's some good things that are happening. I know you guys are, uh, a lot of folks are down on ASQ and not the greatest organization in the world. But my old boss is now chairman of the board, Bland Godfrey of, of ASQ. And um, in his retirement, he's still working at the age of probably 78. Uh, but so we talk all the time. And I'm also um, I was elected to the uh, International Academicians, the International Academy for Quality. And we put out a quality manifesto. And there is a clear recognition that repositioning us as as something different may be beneficial. Some of you newcomers may not remember that ASQ was ASQC, American Society for Quality Control. And it was Dr. Duran who convinced them to drop the C in the American Society for Quality. Well, now that same American Society for Quality thinks the word quality is too narrow and they split into two. And one of their business really basically they want to be like the American Society for Excellence because excellence is broader in their eyes than quality. So the point here is that you, if you don't evolve, you die. I don't know if it's going to be successful with them, but if you don't evolve, you die. And so we have to evolve or die. Due to the technological 
uh, disasters. Uh, technological, um, due to the technology we have that prevents us from creating disasters of other kinds. Uh, so if the future of quality management is di digital, you know, what's our future? Um, since we've been spending so much time on controlling and reducing the cost of poor quality, that the future holds that we need to be the ones to protect our companies against technological failures. And we do that by upskilling ourselves to be smart on technology. Um, here's a good example. Big data requires big data analysts. You would think with all the data analysis capabilities and the quality function, that the number one place we would find big data analysts would be in the quality function. And guess where they're coming from? Not quality. They're coming from universities. Not because we don't know data, but we don't know how to use the technology to collect the data. Uh, and if we don't become that, we probably could lose, we could probably become like a, you know, an accountant that is looking at software that basically eliminate their jobs. But I still think the future is bright. I wish I was starting my career over again. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it may be a whole new world out there if we rethink our purpose. And my new focal point is educating a whole new generation of quality professionals um, that and I'll use that example of the company in China that I'm working with. They don't measure cost of poor quality because they believe that quality is never too expensive. It's priceless to them because if they have one failure, their customers, which are Apples and Samsungs, are going to beat them up. And so I think there's a whole new world out there. And for you guys who understand Disney, um, we might need our own magic carpet to survive the next decade if we don't kind of reposition ourselves. And so what you should think about is in your own company, you, you really become someone who's going to